Hello everyone, it's Jenny. Um, welcome to our the second in our series of Open Education Fellows webinars. Um, thank you for joining us. We want to get a nice sharp 12 o'clock start. Um, our speaker today, our OE fellow, is Maureen Glynn from Ryerson University, and she's going to talk with us about embedding OER in the online course development process. Um, and towards the end, I'll just have a couple of eCampus Ontario announcements and talk about some of the things we're doing and the next webinar in our series. We're going to do a book giveaway this time for the um, for Jesse Stommel and Sean Michael Morris's new book, An Urgency of Teachers, um, as we did last time. So that's really exciting. Um, and I really look forward to learning a little bit more about everyone who's here, uh, including Hattie. <laughs> Um, if you can, if I can ask you in the chat window, and you'll find the chat window by clicking at the bottom of your screen toward the to bottom toolbar. If you can type in uh, your name and your role and what school you're from, that uh, that just helps us all get a sense of who's here joining us today. So, welcome everyone, and I'm going to turn it over to Maureen. Okay, sorry, my, my uh, mute button was not cooperating. <laughs> now it is. Um, and I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute to take a peek at um, who's around the table for the session. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been working here at Ryerson with the digital, digital education strategies team for about eight years. Uh, so during that time, I've um, supported and collaborated on around 50 online courses. And in the past year, I've had the great good fortune to be involved with the eCampus Ontario Open Education Fellows Program. Um, so I'm hoping to share a little bit about my experience in both those capacities with you today. Um, and I'm just taking a look at the chat to see um, who we have with us in terms of are you instructional designers, are you are you teachers, ed tech librarians? So I have a sense of uh, where we're going with the conversation. Okay, great. So we have a, a range of roles, which is really great because I'm kind of hoping we can have. Um, some discussions and I'm really keen to hear from all of you in terms of your own work um, in this area. So let me just share my screen and launch into um, some of what I'm hoping to share with you today. Um, what I've done is set up about 30 minutes of, of stuff to talk about and share. Um, and then I'm hoping we have lots of time to kind of chat and um, hear about what everyone's doing in this area. So I wanted to start by actually sharing two, um, two secrets with you. They're not that secret, but I kind of feel like they're um, uh, not talked about in, in, in some ways. Um, the first secret is that actually um, embedding online uh, OER in online course materials is really not that different than um, embedding other types of resources and tools, obviously, in, in um, online courses. Um, but what's important is that um, if you thoughtfully integrate OER into your online course development process, then it really can unlock some really amazing opportunities um, for you and your students uh, in terms of content, but also, also pedagogically. Um, so um, in terms of what I'm sharing today, I'm, this will be familiar territory for, for most of you, I'm sure. Um, but I just wanted to kind of bring a, a bit of a different and new lens to the course development process and how, how OER um, can be um, of benefit as part of that process. And the second secret is that I don't profess to be an expert in this area, um, but I uh, feel like I'm, I'm learning every day. So I'll share what I've learned with you, um, but I'm also really keen, uh, as I said, to hear from, from you guys. So, so those are the two secrets that I thought I'd start, start off with. Um, and also just wanted to kind of level set um, 
I'm fairly certain that everyone here at this point has a general sense of um, the definition of OER or an understanding of what um, OER represent. But I just wanted to review um, the, the, the sort of uh, key characteristics of OER so that we know what we're talking about when we're looking at their use in online course development. Um, so I, th I thought I would quickly recap the UNESCO definition of OER, which is one that I turn to a lot. Um, they basically define open educational resources as any type of educational materials that are in the public domain or introduced with any open license. The nature of these open materials means that anyone can legally and freely copy, use, adapt, and reshare them. OERs range from textbooks to curricula, syllabi, lecture notes, assignments, tests, projects, audio, video, and animation. So every one of these things is um, obviously um, something that could be made use of in an online course development. Um, beyond that definition, um, again, I'm sure you're all familiar with the five R's that we have up here on the slide, retain, reuse, revise, remix, redistribute. Um, not all OER actually um, meet the, the criteria of the five R's, but many of them um, allow for or afford some of the five R's. Uh, and the overarching characteristic of no cost for users um, can be helpful clearly for students if you're looking at uh, the case of something like an open textbook. But in the context of online course development, it can be helpful as well, because if you're launching into the process of designing a course and you're looking at materials for which you know you won't have to budget um, for permissions, things like that, that can be really helpful. So uh, just, uh, again, kind of um, putting our cards on the table and, and uh, reestablishing the idea of what we're talking about when we're looking at using open educational resources uh, in online course development. So um, I, I've kind of shaped the presentation around our typical online course development process, and I'm sure everyone has a variation on this theme. But of course, when you're um, at the beginning and you're kicking off an online course development, course planning is, is what you're doing. Um, so um, the reason I have this bit.ly link at the bottom of the slide is because I'm going to um, kind of walk you through some of the the tools and resources that I'm finding helpful when I'm working with instructors on online course developments um, and kind of explain a bit of my thinking in terms of how they really um, help to boost a given step in the online course development process. So in terms of course planning, um, most people when they're um, starting to plan or design a course, they basically start in the most broad way looking at the big ideas, the topics, the themes, um, and even more importantly, the sort of um, the outcomes or the what they're hoping their students or the people they imagine will be their students, although sometimes their actual students may be somewhat different from who they imagine their students will be, and OER can help with that as well. <laughs> um, but if you think about the fact that you're starting really broadly, looking at um, topics, themes, big ideas, um, important questions, and outcomes, um, what I find, and I'm gonna head to um, the document that I've put together for the session, which I've definitely left editable for all of you, because the more we, we kind of share and contribute, the better. Um, I just wanted to go through a few resources um, that can provide really just food for thought around the things that are involved in that first step of course planning. So if you look at something like MIT OpenCourseWare, um, where you can search um, courses across disciplines and you can maybe drill down and take a look at some of their syllabi, um, you can maybe map some of your own assumptions against what other people are doing in your discipline. Um, and again, at this point, it's really potentially just food for thought as you're piecing together your plan. Um, but you may find that with um, some of the resources that I'm going to be sharing, you might then drill further and find 
uh, content and related resources that might be helpful as well. So MIT OpenCourseWare is one place to look for things like that. Uh, Lumen Learning is another place where you can look for um, courses. Um, I'm just going to click on let me see, biology. Maybe. Uh, so you can see if you click on biology for majors, you can take a peek at the course content. You can see how they've decided to break down the course. But you can look at things like their course learning outcomes as well uh, and drill right down to uh, a quite detailed spreadsheet of where they've been mapping some of their learning outcomes and thoughts on how they've designed this particular course. Um, another resource is um, the Sailor Academy. They have courses you can look at, um, the Open University in the UK, uh, so there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, opportunities and places where you can really just sort of get your your creative juices flowing and take a look at what other people in your field are doing um, and in your discipline. Um, similarly, if you're an, a, a librarian or instructional designer who's collaborating, these are just great um, sort of uh, ground uh, to start um, generating some ideas when you're collaborating with an instructor. Um, so beyond just the sort of topics, themes, and, and starting to get into some of the outcomes, you're going to sh shift from there to thinking about, well, if this is, if these are the things I'm thinking about, what are the learning events and activities and things like that um, that I want to share with my students in my online course to help um, support their learning and help them move towards some of the outcomes that I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, so one resource that I like, and um, what I should say about some of these resources, and, and this resource here from Thompson Rivers University I'm about to share, are truly open in the sense that there's material here that you can draw from for ideas, but it's also um, a place where you can share back some of your ideas. Um, and um, in the case of this site, uh, it's basically a searchable set of learning activities. Um, from a range of contributors and across a range of disciplines. And they've been really thoughtful in terms of how they've set up um, the, the search activities within this site. So you can, uh, if you're um, using Blooms uh, in, and that's guiding some of your thoughts on outcomes, you can look based on Bloom taxonomy level, discipline, types of interaction, um, and again, once you've worked through your own online course development, um, if you've come up with acti activities of your own, this is a great place to share back out with the community. Other great spots to find um, some thoughts and ideas about learning events and activities and assessments as well, when you're in that course planning stage of your online course development. Um, the Open Pedagogy Notebook is um, like the Thompson Rivers resource that I just shared, a place where um, people are beginning to contribute their ideas um, around assignments um, and learning activities that help, uh, that are basically based on the idea that um, you can build um, learning with open educational resources and really engage your students in that learning. Uh, and the Open Pedagogy Notebook is um, a great spot to find those types of ideas. And of course, uh, Hattie's daddy <laughs> is the uh, the founder and uh, and um, the instigator of the Open Faculty Patchbook. Um, Terry just presented on this uh, at Open Ed 18, and it's a great place um, to uh, if you're if you're someone who subscribes to or or, or uh, looks to high leverages high leverage teaching practices. The con contributions here are, are kind of spawned and, and kicked off by those ideas and those practices. So this is just a great spot um, to take a look for um, ideas for learning activities and, and design ideas for your online course. And again, when, if, you're, if you're open to sharing back, then uh, this is a great place to do that. Okay. 
Um, so after course planning, um, you are going to pull together what you've thought around uh, that your thoughts around topics, themes, um, learning objectives, learning outcomes, and of course you're going to be turning your um, your mind towards uh, you know the, the content, the tools that will help to shore up and support all of all, all of those ideas. Um, so I just wanted to uh, point to, sorry, I've got so many tabs open, I'm gonna close a bunch of them. Um, some of the search tools um, that are available now, um, if you are looking for some of the resources and tools that might uh, support your student learning and your teaching in your online course, um, uh, once you've kind of put those foundational ideas together about what you want to accomplish with your course, so one of the newer tools, um, which is um, one of the best news stories in OER, I think in the last couple of months, is um, that uh, SUNY Geneseo um, down in New York has put together this tool, Oasis, which um, has, I believe, uh, something like 150,000 or more um, items that have been pulled together. Um, and it, it's basically aggregating um, the uh, items that are found across, I think, 50 or more repositories. Um, and it's just a great place to start searching. And you can see um, you have the opportunity to search by type of item or material, uh, or you can just do a broader search across the board for things that are related to your course or to your um, uh, learning objectives, your, your discipline, um, you name it. Uh, it's it's um, been a huge help, I know, to myself and my team in, in honing um, and, and getting our search up and going. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, you know, 10 years ago, their OER were everywhere, but it may not have been as easy to find some of them. Discoverability had, has been a problem in the past, but I, I, efforts like this one are really going a long way to assisting um, those of us who support instructors as well as instructors in um, accessing and finding high quality content and high quality tools to support their work in online course development and to support their work if they're hoping to become more open in their practice as educators. Uh, other tools include um, the George Mason MetaFinder. Um, it's similar to Oasis in um, that it, um, aggregates um, the results from across quite a number of repositories. Um, and um, one of the librarians uh, from uh, here at Ryerson, her explanation of the difference between, well, the, the, of course, uh, it's the great work of librarians that has brought us tools like Oasis, but also, and also George Mason. Uh, George Mason just pulls in a little bit more um, metadata and uh, depending on how you like to search, you, you'll likely end up with a preference, uh, or you may use both. But they're they're both just great tools in terms of starting to pull results um, and find content that might work for your online course. Um, and finally, um, of course, the eCampus Ontario Open Library is growing. Um, um, Jenny can correct, or Lillian can correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's already at least 200 or over 200 textbooks for sure in the library uh, with more on the way and more being added all the time. Um, but I've put the eCampus library here as a reminder that um, as good as some of the search tools that I just mentioned and aggregators are, um, it's just a reminder that um, there are OER out there that may still not be on the radar and may not be in some of those repositories. Um, so they may not be picked up by some of the tools that I just mentioned. Um, so it never hurts to go straight to the source, something like the Campus Ontario Library, the BC Campus Library, um, or even institutional sites. Um, uh, and that's not even beginning to go into just uh, broader searches um, and matching searches with CC licenses, for example. Um, so, but I just wanted to mention some of the tools that we've been using um, 
here with my team um, in supporting our online course developers um, in the last few months. Okay. Um, the other thing I would say before I leave um, the course planning stage is um, if open practice is something that's of interest to you and if you're hoping to make increasing use of OER, open educational resources in your work, um, uh, Nash and Benny and Burgos are two um, researchers and I'll come back to their work at the end of the session who uh, have done a lot of work thinking through, uh, um, they've done a lot of work, Catherine Cronin, uh, other people have done work just thinking through the profile of an open educator and um, in terms of their framework, development framework, one of the things that they've identified um, among um, highly active open educators is that they just talk to people about their course planning. So maybe they're talking initially just to people in their own department, they might talk to past students, um, they might reach out depending on how involved they are in social media to a larger community. But when it comes to online course planning, um, part of being open is really just you know, going out into your community and talking to people about uh, what they think um, and, and what you might consider in, in putting into your course. So just a quick um, note to here to say, um, whoops, sorry, regardless of what you do find, um, quality is always important to, to students and instructors. And I just wanted to point you to um, the work of um, Ishan Ebeordina, Eb sorry, I probably didn't do a very good job of uh, his last name, but hopefully he'll forgive me. Um, so this, um, this model here is just, uh, we've adapted some ideas he had. And again, this just really touches on a lot of what you would be looking at with any resources or materials that you pull together for a course around currency, reliability, authorship, um, purpose, um, all of those things. Uh, but it adds that lens of um, openness and access, um, how, how editable is, uh, is an item that you're looking at, how, how openly available is it. Um, and this is just sort of a quick step through model of how um, ideally in collaboration, maybe uh, an instructor and um, an instructional designer, if, if they're available, librarian um, can work through searching for um, and identifying open educational resources that will be helpful with their course and kind of locking in some of their ideas around OER that they might um, uh, make use of. Okay, so content development, all the planning has happened, you have your, your ideas in place, then you start taking those building blocks that you've, um, that you've pulled together and you take the building blocks and you start um, forming them into your online, your online course materials. Um, and when you're doing that, um, what I find, um, you ultimately find yourself pulling even more resources. <laughs> um, um, and sometimes that's may, that might just be to um, ensure that your online course has an engaging look and feel, um, but also as you are putting those building blocks together, it inevitably kind of spurs on new ideas about things you might want to look for or pull into your course. So I just wanted to share a few tools. Um, I'm going to go back and close some tabs again because <laughs> getting busy here on my screen. Um, few, a few tools um, that I found helpful and that my team has found helpful. Of course, Creative Commons Search um, is just a great place to start because um, it will guide you to um, items that are typically licensed in a way um, that are free of, of um, the requirement to uh, go any further for permissions. Um, I, I, didn't plan to do a, a CC licensing review in this session, and I'm pretty sure everybody here knows all about that, so, um, and has likely used the, the Creative Commons search, so I'll just mention that. Um, I have found in my work, um, the Noun Project is a great site. Um, in online learning, um, 
when you're putting together content, it's nice um, if you're guiding your students through the content to have some visual cues, for example, that tip them off about certain types of content or activities. Um, so I find the icons in the noun project, which are all um, freely licensed and allow you with attribution to make use of the work, um, I find them really wonderful. Um, they're just clean, crisp, clear, and, and there's just an amazing array of, of icons available through the noun project. So that's something that we've definitely made use of here in our, um, in our online courses. Um, Unsplash and Pixabay, um, same idea, but um, more around um, photography, um, just beautiful, um, colorful and engaging um, images that can really help bring your course to life, your, your online course. Um, and uh, again, freely licensed, um, CC licensed, where generally attribution is the key requirement. Um, some other tools um, that you could take a look at uh, in terms of audio video, uh, audio visual, um, rich media. Um, Vimeo has um, an area where you can look at CC licensed um, video and they have categorized it based on the type of license, which I find really helpful. Um, free music archive, if you're putting something together yourself, maybe creating a video and you need a bit of a soundtrack, you can take a look at a place like the Free Music Archive. Um, and beyond that, I have a couple of sites here. I'm going to ca call this Alte because I don't know how to pronounce it otherwise, um, which is um, a growing catalog of um, more like tools and platforms uh, that are open source and openly licensed, but may be very useful to you in your online course development. Um, and also H5P. So if as part of your online course planning, some of the learning activities that you um, landed on included things like um, knowledge checks, quick self-assessments, um, and you're looking for learning objects and interactive um, activities that you can easily implement in your course to um, accomplish that with your students. H5P is a great uh, open community where people have contributed all of those types of um, activities and made it easy to embed them in your course. Um, so, Obviously, CC licensing comes in um, with a lot of these things, and with CC licensing often comes, importantly, um, attribution. <laughs> um, so I've just shown a couple of tools here um, that um, have to do with attribution. Um, I'm just going to advance my slides as well. Um, this is just a quick and easy mnemonic that I know it helps me when I'm just kind of drafting things and, and pulling materials together. Um, in terms of attribution, title, artist, source, and license. Uh, or in many cases with online course development, it might be an author who you're citing. Um, in, there's an example here on the slide. Um, so with the authorship, sometimes you can create that link to the original source. And then um, the licenses um, through CC, uh, Creative Commons um, are easily um, available to link to, but you can also use tools, excuse me, um, like the Open Washington Attribution Builder. I'll just show you quickly. It's sort of um, not a pick and play, but if you kind of fill the right fields, then it will um, help you put together the attribution that you need based on what you're maybe adapting or adopting in your course. Um, and the BC Campus OER Faculty Toolkit has a great page as well to help step you through and guide you through examples um, and instructions for properly uh, citing and providing attributions for OER that you're using um, in your work and in, in this case in your online course. Uh, and then in the case that you've perhaps um, in the midst of your online course development created things that you want to share yourself 
as well. Um, there's the Creative Commons license generator that walks you through the steps of um, deciding and creating the license that you would like to go with to share your own work. Okay, so after um, you've worked through all the planning and built, brought all the building blocks together, created all your course materials, then things get really fun because you actually get to launch your online course development. Um, and that's where I, I'm finding more and more um, with our online instructors. I'm, I just make a pitch to sort of keep that open spirit alive um, through um, just openness and transparency with your students um, from the very beginning. Um, having taken the time and thought to put together a syllabus, um, you know, right from the very beginning, it's a good idea, of course, um, to engage your students in a discussion around the course outline and around the syllabus, um, get a sense for who they are and how that, that um, plan might work for them. Um, beyond that, um, it's important as well to, um, if you're gauging things throughout the course, so you have a check-in at the beginning on the outline, you have a check-in midway through on how things are going, are the strategies and content working for the students? The great thing about OER is the flexibility allows for tweaking. So if you're hearing for your, from your students, stop something, start something, continue something, then OER, their, their um, flexibility allows for you to make those changes. Um, and I have included a link to um, uh, National Bini and Brugos um, research through the Open Education Open Educators Factory here um, <clears throat> to just give you some food for thought. Once you've launched your course, if you want to continue along a path um, to open practice and and becoming a more open educator, they have a great framework that just um, helps. Um, provide food for thought in terms of your own practice, what you might do um, in terms of reaching out into the wider community to share the work that you've done or to get feedback on your work um, and uh, also um, sharing uh, your actual products of your work. Um, I, in terms of online courses, I know um, Many of us are in situations where you can't necessarily um, share out openly your your online course content per se, but there may be artifacts and and different products that you've produced as part of the course that um, you can share openly. Um, and ideally, over time, uh, all of our institutions will be providing clearer and better guidance around um, how and when you can share with the wider community. So um, I wanted to just kind of wrap up um, by saying that Jenny um, shared, um, I guess, a phrase with, with um, ha or sh off often shares this phrase about open being an invitation. Um, and I find that so helpful in my work because it kind of takes the migraine inducing pressure off um, and helps me to feel that open is something that um, you can start by just going into the shallow end and waiting around and learning and then you can grow your practice from there. Um, and um, I find that this phrase and this idea really guides my work in online course development. So I just wanted to share that with you because um, from the time that Jenny first said it, I, I found it to be incredibly helpful. And um, that's what I have to share. So um, I, I, I can tell just from the names and faces and people I've seen in the group that you already had this before today, but I'm hoping that this has, um, has given you some food for thought and some ideas. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Jenny and I'll look at the chat and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. 
Thanks, Maureen. That was awesome. So yeah, I mean, we really want to have some conversations. I, uh, I kind of went through and, and quickly muted people that weren't muted just because I forget to do that myself. And then I'm typing away and <laughs> everyone's annoyed. <laughs> Um, but you feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put a question in the chat. Um, maybe to get us rolling, Maureen, I'm just curious to know, um, how's it going? Like what kinds of, how are our faculty members receptive to this conversation as part of your course designs? Because I know you do a ton of course designs at the Chang mm -hmm. School. Mm -hmm. I've been um, pleased, pleasantly, I'm not going to say surprised, but I've, I have been um, encouraged by the enthusiasm um, that has has um, that, that we've been met with at any point that either myself or my, my colleagues share um, ideas around open with with faculty um, we're, we're right in the midst of um, we're kind of right in the guts of our winter 2019 course developments right now. So I'm really keen to see um, where things go with that as um, we, we typically have 13 modules in our online courses and as the modules are coming in, um, I'm going to be checking in with my instructional design colleagues and our production editors to see where things are going. But in that early course planning stage um, where we very deliberately built in um, conversations and supports for open, um, we were hearing not only about the courses that people are working on here with us, but we were hearing from people about things they wanted to take back to their departments <laughs> to talk about. And the great thing about the conversations we found is it really helps people to understand that they've, there's a lot of people who've been out in the open or have been using open practices all along. And this helps them to frame what they've been doing in a really helpful way. So I've certainly had, um, more than a few instructors um, quite happily find things like open textbooks that they didn't know existed. Um, but also um, on at least one occasion, we've had a developer um, be part of our conversation and come out of it saying, I, we, my department and I literally have this whack of content <laughs> that we've been sharing with students and didn't really know there was a, a framework or a way to share it openly. And so, so that has been really, encouraging um, and certainly in terms of design and um, opportunities for engagement and enriching courses um, things like um, freely licensed images and uh, those types of things we're seeing wi widely used and that has helped um, just keep things rolling for a lot of our course developments because and we're not waiting around to hear back from publishers or um, stock sites or you know things like that um, around permissions. It just kind of keeps things smooth and running in a more streamlined way, knowing that we don't necessarily um, have to go for permissions. If we're using something that's CC licensed, um, we can integrate it easily. And we're, um, when it comes to larger chunks of content, we're, we're honing our skills around properly um, attributing and, and making sure that we're um, giving credit where credit's due. So that's kind of where things are right now. Okay, great. So I'm seeing a question from Jackie Tan, mm -hmm. wondering what is the catalyst that got you and your team started on OER? That's a really good question. Um, I know for me personally, I, I just, um, over the years, you know, when I first heard about OER, I, I became something I wanted to research. Um, Accessibility and flexibility seems to be in my DNA. I had a whole past life where I worked um, uh, with an organization called the Barrier Free Design Center, and we uh, our mandate was just to make the built environment more accessible to everyone. And um, so I became interested in universal design for learning. And then as the open movement grew, I realized that this was something that could be very helpful for instructors and students. Um, and then as I began to share with my team, we all realized um, that one of the best things about open is that when we're collaborating on online course developments, um, it helps to take the focus off content because <laughs> our team would often find that um, it, 
became very stressful for instructors to imagine that in an eight month period, we have an eight month turnaround generally on our online course developments. They, they often, uh, no matter how we communicated things to them, they often came away feeling they had to create um, lots of content. And I, I personally found, and some of my colleagues found that that took away from the opportunity for conversations about creativity with assessment and with um, learning events and things like that that could happen um, when the course is running and that could happen to, to support the learning uh, because their time and energies were really focused on content. So we came together and realized if we introduce them to the idea of open educational resources, it may give them the sense that they don't have to reinvent the wheel and that if they're pulling an online course together, um, they can um, seek uh, material from the community that might support what they're doing and take the pressure off on the content side. And then that absolutely gives them the freedom and space to think about um, how they can um, work creatively with the students uh, to achieve a bit more active learning and um, look at maybe a, a new perspective on assessment as well. So that's kind of the catalyst overall. Okay, great. And Jackie, does that uh, satisfy your, your quest for knowledge? Is that what you're looking for? I know it's hard to unmute. Uh, maybe Maureen, do you want to work on Janice Weaver's question about blending OER with paid publisher resources? Yes. Market for content creators who need to be paid is shrinking. <laughs> um, that, is, that is a really tricky question. And it's, it's, um, it's challenging on a few levels because um, the data is showing that even when content creators are paid um, for things like textbooks, the data is showing the students aren't buying them. <laughs> um, so if ultimately we are aiming for good learning outcomes for the students um, and they're having to make choices that, um, that are causing them um, stress, um, it's it's just it's it's tricky and it's challenging now again as i mentioned um one of the things that has been really meaningful for me is uh jenny's point that open is an invitation it's not an expectation it's it's not a requirement and absolutely there are there are are courses and areas where um publishers content will continue to be needed um so I, I definitely don't think that, that we're, our objective is to, um, well, well, open educational resources are low or no, or no cost um, for users. They're definitely, they, they can't, they shouldn't be, and they're not free to create. So part of the issue is, is also maybe just a shifting of resources um, to, um, to ensuring that content creators are still compensated. Um, but if they're working in an institution, um, then maybe there are ways for that compensation to come through, whether it's government or within their institution and in, in, through creative reallocation <laughs> of resources. Um, so I guess that's how, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to, to, to answer that question entirely, but that's kind of my perspective and, and I would invite anyone in, in, the, um, in the webinar here to also share their thoughts on that. But I, I appreciate that that's an important question, Janice, for sure. Uh, what project management approaches do you use? Okay, uh, sorry, I'm just taking a look at Rosary's question. Initiate OERs into the early stages of course creation. Yes. When do we convince them? Project management. Yes. Okay. So um, we introduced the whole idea of OER right from um, the absolute beginning of any of our course development projects. We have something, uh, well, we have a, basically we have a, a project kickoff meeting for everyone who works with us on an online course development. 
So during that meeting, we just, um, we simply introduced the idea that OER exists and that they're an option that can be considered. Then um, we, when we move into course planning with them, we currently have a um, process where we bring the subject matter experts and instructors who are working with us towards a course development for a given um, semester. So for, I was saying earlier that we're working right now with the winter 2019 course developer cohort. Um, we have course planning workshops and so during those workshops, we get a little bit more um, in depth around uh, our entire course development process. We work through the nuts and bolts of course planning with them. And at that point, we um, actively support them in looking at OER as an option, um, not as a requirement, as an option, um, both with respect to readings, texts, um, tools, um, all of those things that they might make use of in their course. Um, and um, in terms of the project management of the whole thing, um, typically the instructional designer is the, is the main contact, but um, we engage our colleagues. We have production editors who are well-versed in OER permissions, licensing attributions, and our, so our subject matter experts and instructors know that those people are at the ready to support them if they do decide to use OER as part of their course development. Um, and I, don't, I hope, Rosary, that that kind of helped a little bit with your question, <laughs> but let's see what else. Um, yeah, paying content creators, like, Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that makes sense to lots of people because it make, certainly makes sense to us. Hi, Maureen. It's Jenny. I just I just want to add that that often content creators are paid to create the OER, which is really exciting, um, and it really varies. Um, sometimes, for example, OpenStax pays a lot of money to the multiple authors of their their open textbooks, which are you know very well re highly researched. Uh, eCampus Ontario, we had um, an open textbook fund last year from the government of Ontario, and um, we paid you know varying amounts depending on whether it was an adaptation or whether it was a full new creation. Um, but we're very much in favor, I think, of paying authors for sure. And often in the course, and this varies as well, often in the course, online course development process, um, the subject matter experts are paid for the process. Uh, and I think we're starting to look at new models where if they are willing, um, because they were paid to create the resources, would they consider making them open? Is there any academic advantage to them on, for, in terms of their reputation or their research? Um, to make those materials open if they're developing them anyway uh, as part of a paid contract. So I think there's there's multiple models. And I think Queens, Rosari, even Queens has a model where you have a small fund for creation or adaptation of OER. Is that right? Hi, Jenny. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, it's Rosari. Um, yes, we do. So we, 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 we basically, we did a pilot um, for the last academic year, 2017-18, and we're on the cusp of putting out a call for a second round of proposals, but again, these are fairly small internal uh, grants that are available. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's not the amount of money involved. It's just the recognition and, and support of authorship that's, that's sometimes valuable. Um, we actually, I should mention, we have just kicked off um, for the first time this fall here at Ryerson. We do have a grant program through our library as well um, for um, adoption, adaptation, creation. Um, currently sort of smaller packages of funding, but they're available, they're there, and they're kind of demonstrating that support, um, which has been great through our library here at Ryerson for that kind of work. Jackie's asking to follow up a question about the quality. How do we, how do we engage the conversation about the quality of OERs? This is a very common faculty member question, right? right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so a few things, and I would, again, invite everyone to jump in here, because I know I'm, I'm in good company um, for people knowledgeable, <laughs> uh, members of the open community here. Um, in terms of the open 
if you're looking at open texts, um, huge, huge um, majority of them at this point, certainly the ones uh, through BC campus, OpenStax, um, have been reviewed um, by one or more, um, uh, like they've been peer reviewed certainly within the discipline. Um, I know eCampus has put out calls for, for reviewers as well. Um, understanding that time is a factor, uh, it's it it's well it's it's not easy to to do a thorough and complete review when you're pulling together an online course. Um, I'm thinking people would generally review any material that they're going to be using with their with their students and and um, whether it's the the, um, the craps <laughs> uh, model or the there are different frameworks that where you I mean you're looking at really looking at a lot of the same things whether it's OER or not you know. Um, is it current? You know, who is the author? Um, you know, how what you know how old? Like when was it? When was it written? Um, those things don't change between OER or or um, other types of resources. Um, but I, the the quality issue is not one that's been ignored by um, the creators of open educational resources. Um, and also, when you move away from things like textbooks, often Open education, open educational resources. Um, <clears throat> there's more and more actual learning modules that are available. Um, in Ontario, I know some of the funded learning modules have been collab collaborations across institutions. So again, you have that kind of um, uh, peer review built in um, through collaboration across institutions, and people are checking and, and contributing and and um, monitoring one another's work to um, ultimately create a, a higher quality end product. Um, but for sure, I, I, it's a question that comes up over and over again, um, but I think it's one that the open community is doing everything they can to, to answer. Jenny, I don't know if you have more to add there, or you might be able to speak more eloquently to the question than I can, but. No, I, I, you know, I think you covered it. Um, I was attending a very funny session at OE Global uh, in Delft, um, where someone from the SUNY organization, an instructor from the SUNY organization said, you know, ultimately the, the issue of quality rests with the subject matter expert who's teaching a course. Um, OER are not different um, in terms of how you would review them and determine whether or not they align with your learners needs and the topics that you want to teach. You have to take a look and this is um, OER has not yet, the, those who publish OER have not really yet been able to form a, an, OE, an open sales force where they can go to your, your office as an, as an instructor and show you a copy of the textbook and talk it through with you. Um, but it's the same concept. You would always, you'd want a desk copy, you'd want to take a look at a digital copy, review the resource. And I know for many faculty members that it's so overwhelming when you do a search in one of these repositories, you get so many hits. If you know, if your search is really broad, <laughs> they'll see a million and five, you know, things that they could choose, and that becomes very frustrating. We're starting to see some really good traction in terms of um, libraries, in particular, in at colleges and universities in Ontario, making discipline-specific lists of of what they believe are good quality resources. That becomes very helpful for faculty members. If you can see, if you're a biology instructor and you just want to see um, the highly regarded biology resources, then then librarians are a super great resource to kind of narrow that down a little bit and start to create these discipline specific lists. So I think there's some some good things happening to try and help people feel more comfortable with the idea of quality. For sure. Can I add something? Sorry, it's Peggy here. Is that okay? Please do. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to weigh in that, that we're still open for reviews, so I'll add that. And we can send you a desk copy if that helps. And if you're reviewing the desk copy and see something that needs changing, I can then get you an account in Pressbooks and you can go in and change it right then and there and use it in your course. So in, in terms of keeping the quality up, uh, that's another way that, that in, in my opinion, it might even be easier to keep the quality up in open because you can, if you find a mistake, you change it right then and there. You don't wait for the next uh, publishing run. My two cents. But if you'd like to review, we are still looking for reviewers of our open textbooks. Awesome, Peg. If Thanks. you can put a link or contact information, Peg. I'll throw it in chat. Thanks. Awesome. 
Uh, does anyone else have questions or want to put their hand up or have comments to offer? All right, I'm going to pop up a slide just because I have a couple of things to, to talk about in terms of eCampus Ontario. Um, and Maureen, um, did we see your contact information go by if people have follow up questions and things like that? Maybe put that in the chat as well. Sorry, my mute button is really <laughs> sticky today. Sorry. Um, it's on the slides, but I'll put it in the chat window as well. And yes, please, please, anyone and everyone feel free to follow up with me. Um, I will be at this email address that I'm going to share until the end of October. <laughs> and then I'm shifting to a new role, still involved in online course development um, at a new institution. Um, I'm excited about that uh, in Ontario. Um, but, but for sure, in the next 10 days or so, um, feel free to reach out. And then my Twitter handle, I'll put in the chat as well. And you could always DM me if you can't find me. <laughs> I don't even know where I'll be finding myself in 10 days. But uh, let me just, oh, sorry. I'll put it in there. Great. Thanks, Maureen. That's awesome. And thank you so much for your talk, Maureen. I'm really excited to. Oh, it's my pleasure hear about it and just hear about the progress that's happening at uh, at your institution. Um, so just I have a couple of things that I want to cover off. Um, thank you all for attending. And um, so our next OE Fellows webinar is with Laura Killam and Aaron Langille. Langle? I always get that wrong. Langle. Uh, <laughs> joining us from up north in Sudbury. And they're going to talk about quest based learning, which is uh, an iteration of gamification. And that's um, they're really exploring that and doing some really fun stuff. So I really recommend um, attending. That is Friday, November 2nd from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. And it's on our eCampus Ontario OE Fellows website. Um, and just reminders, although we, we are full up for the summit, the on Open Education Ontario Summit and for our technology enabled seminar and showcase in November, um, we will be sharing out slides, we'll be tweeting, we'll be sharing out um, recordings of the keynote sessions from TESS, which are Robin DeRosa and Simon Bates, whose 21st century educator model is uh, something we're using for Extend. Uh, and then I'm, uh, I'm going to do the book draw. And I have like a list of names and I'm just like choosing one. And it's Rosari. Congratulations, Rosari. So I'm going to check in and make sure I have your contact information. That book, again, is Jesse Stommel and Michael Sean Morris's uh, An Urgency of Teachers, which is a great digital, critical digital pedagogy book. Um, that is just oh, thank you very much. No, oh, you're welcome, Rosari. Good for you. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to invite Terry Green to just close us out and talk a little bit about 9 by 9 by 25 and extend. Hello, do you hear me? Yep. Hi, Terry. Hi, here's Hattie. Uh, so the 9 by 9 by 25 challenge is a kind of an Ontario Extend side project because we're not running a, a cohort right now. So um, it's uh, the opportunity to share reflective writing about teaching and learning. I'm going to put the link in the chat. What's your, what do you want to say? And um, and so extend itself. The other thing I wanted to say, Ontario Extend, is a it's a an opportunity for faculty and and librarians and technologists and everyone to uh, play around with technology to in order to enable learning experiences. Um, so in because I I mentioned we're not running a cohort right now, we will be running it more like a traditional course than we have before in January. So if you're interested in trying it out, it'll be over 12 weeks in um, edX, more like a MOOC kind of. And everybody's invited, it's free, it's open. Um, it's, it's an open educational resource, so you can check it out right now and use it. Uh, but we can do it together over 12 weeks. There's six modules. Um, and so two mo to a module per two weeks and each module should just take a few hours each so it's not a huge weekly um, commitment but it is a weekly commitment um, so if you're interested watch out for that and uh, I'll send out a sign up form soon very soon so thank you that's all I wanted to say awesome thanks Terry
<laughs> um, all right, Lauren, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll check in with you offline <laughs> about the summit. Yes, and, and we'll figure it out and make sure you have the right information. Um, so thank you everyone. Thank you Maureen so much for all your time and, uh, and sharing your work at Ryerson and the work with this OER in the course development process. Um, and we'll see you next time at the OER Fellows. And, uh, and again, we'll share out a bunch of stuff as much as we can from the summit uh, and from TESS in November.